Good Friday morning, everyone. And happy 11-11. When, uh, when I was young, I think they called it Armistice Day because it was 11-11, uh, uh, what was it, 1918 or uh, when World War I officially uh, the Armistice was signed. So uh, uh, it was Armistice Day and then Peace Day for a, even before that, and uh, then Veterans Day, uh, what we call it now. My father was born on 1111, uh, but it was 1911, even before World War I uh, started. And uh, the he was born in a house in uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, a midwife uh, helped deliver him. And uh, the house was on the house had elevens in it. I believe it was Eleventh Avenue actually, uh, and it was. Uh, uh, he was born at, at uh, 11 something a.m. And uh, the midwife that uh, delivered him was uh, uh, helped fill out the, the birth registry. And she was so impressed with the, with the array of 11s that uh, she put on the, on the paperwork uh, that he was born at 11, 11 a.m. But there's already enough 11s going on, but she, she thought it, was, it would give him luck in life. And uh, I guess compared to many, many individuals, he, he uh, did have a lucky life. I know he grew to be a, uh, a very uh, honest and noble and uh, a, a good father and uh, he died uh, when he was like 61 years old so i i'm already you know uh, 14 years older than my father ever was which is kind of a freaky thing to look back at your memories of uh, of your own parent as uh, as a younger person. Be that as it may, uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, uh, my father this this morning. And uh, instead of uh, going on and on about personal personal things, which I, you know, I could, I write about him uh, and his family, uh, who I never met. I never met uh, his father or his mother, and it's only in the last few years that I'm finding out anything about uh, his mother, who's who is uh, British, and his father, who my father always told me uh, was uh, a Frenchman, but I think what he really meant was he was a French Canadian, because he could. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, my father's mother came from England. She was born in England, born in London. And my father always told me that uh, her father uh, was uh, uh, a police detective and, uh, and a noted police detective. So I always assumed that was either Scotland Yard or the the Metropolitan uh, Police. But it's only recently that I ran across newspaper articles of the day uh, touting him as uh, uh, a private detective uh, in the very years that private detectives were getting notoriety uh, because of Arthur Conan Doyle's 
Sherlock Holmes. Well, my great-grandfather, Harland, uh, was indeed uh, a famous detective. And he worked for years tracking down missing and exploited women and girls uh, under the sponsorship of the Salvation Army. And his detective agency was, was, according to the newspapers of the day, the only international detective agency uh, in the world. And his success rate at tracking down missing girls and missing women uh, year after year uh, dwarfed the figures uh, of success uh, logged by the uh, by Scotland Yard. So uh, I even found pictures of him in the newspaper and stuff. It was so cool. Okay. But his wife, okay, uh, his wife obviously uh, 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 he didn't uh, he didn't spend a lot of time at home and stuff and his his wife, at least according to uh, what uh, uh, my grandmother Duquette told my mother, was a very wicked woman. Uh, she actually called her a witch, and by that she uh, didn't mean a nature-loving, life-affirming neo-pagan, but as someone that uh, delighted in doing evil things to people. Uh, cursing them and things like that. And I write about it, I believe, in uh, my book, uh, Low Magic, or excuse me, uh, probably Homemade Magic. Be that as it may, we're talking about my father, and shortly after he died, far too young, I had a visitation from him. And uh, most everybody has uh, the stories of uh, visitations and stuff. I, and I'm trying to find the chapter here uh, of my, it's called My Father's Ghost. And I'm reading from uh, uh, Mag or My Life of the Spirits. Let's see, My Father's Ghost 63. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Now, I had just joined the Rosicrucian Order Amwork about the time he died. And I was just sort of getting out of the, the uh, wild and crazy musician life of a recording artist. And... Uh, sort of filling the gap of uh, my life of excesses with the mystical practices and, and techniques and things that I was learning in the Rosicrucians. So, My Father's Ghost, Chapter 11. Most everyone would agree that object the objective Reality, excuse me, most everyone would agree that objective reality is a world where living things are just that. Living things such as people or dogs or cats or elephants. Moreover, symbols are not alive but are abstract representation of ideas. Most people think that. It's been my experience, however, that the opposite is true on the magical plane. Symbols are alive. And living things are generally symbols of something. When I see an angel or a magical beast in a dream or vision or scrying session, it's usually a symbolic encounter with a concept concerning a personal or magical issue that is too complex to be expressed or understood 
through any other medium. The same living, uh, these same living apparitions appear to be symbols, as if they were alive. A simple geomantic figure, such as a cross, or, or excuse me, a simple geometric figure, such as a cross or a pentagram drawn in the air in the face of a pesky spirit, is often enough to send it fleeing in terror. The basic rule of thumb un unravels when one is faced in a dream or vision with the li living image of a dead person. Is it alive or is it a symbol? Almost everyone who's ever lost a loved one has at least one visitation story to tell. Usually the deceased appears in a vivid dream or, or vision a week or two after dying and delivers a message to the effect that everything is okay and not to worry. I used to think that this phenomenon was a natural denial mechanism of the mind, triggered at times when it's easier to accept a, a hallucination rather than dealing with grief and the great mystery of death. Now I'm not so sure. When I was 24, when my father died of emphysema, that's what they called it in those days, emphysema, a few weeks after seeing Jean-Paul, our son, take his first steps, he was only 61. About 10 days after his funeral, he showed up to deliver a curious message. Since my initiation into Amorc, that's the Rosicrucian Order uh, Amorc, I had set aside an hour or two each Thursday night to study the monographs and practice the various outlined psychic exercises. For some reason, I decided this night I would perform my devotions before dinner and set up my sanctum altar in the bedroom. Those are cool little, uh, they call it a t telesterian, the Rosicrucians call it. And it was uh, l like you'd sit at a dressing table with a, with a mirror and you'd put two candles on either side of the mirror uh, sort of to illuminate your face and you'd light some incense and, and uh, you'd read your monograph and and do uh, some slight uh, uh, mental exercise or meditation of some kind. That's uh, called your sanctum altar. Okay. Amark even sold little embroidered altar cloth and stuff. It's, it's charming. Okay. For some reason, I decided this night I'd perform my devotions before dinner and set up my sanctum altar in the bedroom. I opened the temple with the usual ceremonial formalities, unsealed my new monograph and started to read. Almost immediately, I found I could not keep my mind focused on the words. I found myself reading the same sentence over and over again until I became extremely sleepy. I finally gave up trying altogether and decided to take a little nap before dinner and I'd pick up my studies later. I blew out both candles because they always said don't ever fall asleep with candles. Rosicrucian lesson number one, never fall asleep with candles burning. Okay. So I did that. I blew out both candles and stretched out in the cool darkness. In those days, it was my habit, when sleeping on my back, to cross my arms over my breast. I closed my eyes and was instantly out. Suddenly, I became conscious that the room was no longer dark. I remember thinking that I'd broken the very first safety rule of fledgling mystics 
and allowed myself to fall asleep with the candles burning. I opened my eyes and looked up at the ceiling, and I could see every detail bathed in a warm orange light. Then I noticed that my arms were no longer crossed over my chest, but stretched out crucifixion style. That struck me as very curious because I knew I hadn't been asleep long enough to change positions. The pit of my stomach tingled with, a, with that joyous thrill I always feel when I dream I'm flying. But I wasn't flying. I was flat on my back on the bed. I turned my head to the left and looked down my arm to see my hand dangling over the mattress. Then I turned to the right and to my utter delight discovered my father sitting by the bed, not six inches from my right hand. He looked great. Better, in fact, than I had seen him in years. I felt younger just looking at him. His skin was a beautiful tan and his hair was thicker and darker than I ever remembered. He didn't say a word. And for some reason I wasn't inclined to speak either. We just looked at each other. I soon became conscious of the peculiarity of the moment. The light in the room did not come from the candles or the electric lights, but seemed to radiate from every object in the room, <clears throat> most especially from Dad and me. There was a tangible silence. As if the whole world was holding its breath. I had the feeling that if anything were to move, it would do so in blissfully slow motion. Then it finally dawned on me. I was sleeping. Dad was dead. And all this was very weird indeed. I had the presence of mind to realize that the thrill in the pit of my stomach was symptomatic of astral projection, and this whole experience might not be a dream at all, but a bona fide case of psychic contact with the dead. To test my theory, I willed myself to float slowly to the ceiling and back down again. And I did it with ease. It was just like one of those astral projection uh, uh, cartoon drawings where a person's laying on their back and then they, they float out of their body. And it was just like that. Oh, they got all the way to the ceiling and it went, yeah, and then I floated back. But I digress. I looked over at dad and he smiled. He seemed amused, but a little impatient. Then with great deliberation, he lifted his right hand. He wore a beautiful golden ring with a blue stone setting. The stone was enam enameled, oh, excuse me, the stone was embellished with the Masonic square and compass. However, upon clo and Dad was a Mason, he's a 32nd degree Mason. However, upon closer examination, I saw that superimposed on the square was a downward pointing triangle surmounted by an onk, very similar to the Amork symbol or device. Is this your message? I uh, asked mentally. He smiled and pointed to the ring. I had no idea what this meant. He delivered the wordless message with such drama and grace that for the time being I didn't care what it meant. 
It was just a beautifully pleasant moment. I choked up a little, like I do when I almost cry at the movies. I closed my eyes just for an instant to control the tears. I took a deep breath and then I opened my eyes. The room was dark. My arms were folded over my chest. My father was gone. A week or so later, Constance and I visited Aunt Vina. That's my father's sister. My father's sister in Long Beach. I mentioned to her that I was studying the Amorc monographs. And she said, in that case, I've got something for you. She went to her bookcase and plucked several very old Amorc books and some bound monographs from the 1930s. I took the lessons for about five years, she said, as she handed me the books. You're welcome to these old monographs. Your father tried to join when he was 17 or 18, but in those days you had to be 21 years old to join the Rosicrucians. He was heartbroken. He was so thrilled when the Masons accepted him about the time you were born. This little tidbit of family history did not exactly explain my father's visitation. But at the time, it served to encourage me concerning my direction of my spiritual life that I was heading into. However, in the years to follow, when the mysteries of Rosicrucianism and esoteric Freemasonry would become the centerpiece of my magical life, I'd come to understand that the message of my father's ghost was uncannily prophetic. And that's my little comment on the, the Feast of Clifford Moss. Yes, his name was Clifford Ernest Duquette. And uh, so when I created the rabbi, to write the Chicken Kabbalah. It was Rabbi Lamed, which is my initials, LMD, Ben Clifford, son of Clifford. I think he would have got a kick out of that. Until tomorrow, have a great weekend, everybody. Saturday morning cartoons tomorrow, I hope. Continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.